So this next section in 16.2 talks about natural selection. Now remember that natural selection can only happen when there's already a lot of variation within a population because we need to be able to change something and if everything's the same then there's no possible options for changing. So we need to have variation present in the environment first. Now when we have this variation and we expose it to an environment, natural selection favors the variant, so whichever group of individuals that is adaptive or provides an advantage under the current environmental condition. So whichever one is can survive and reproduce the best is going to be favored. So there are three kinds of natural selection. This is stabilizing selection, directional selection, and disruptive selection. We're going to give examples of each. But basically what these curves show is the distribution of variation. We're going to see how they change based on what kind of natural selection it is. So the first one is stabilizing selection. Stabilizing selection is when an intermediate phenotype can improve the adaptation of the environment. So extreme phenotypes are favored against and intermediates are favored. So you can see how in this example, this is a Swiss starling and what happens is they lay eggs to have offspring obviously and they lay four or five eggs and this is the most adaptive. If they lay less than four eggs, the chances of having the most survive are fewer and if they lay more than five eggs, they're offspring are less likely to survive. So think of it this way. If they lay less than four eggs, then they only have a chance for three to survive, and if one of them dies, then they're only passing on two offspring or something like that. If they lay four to five eggs, the chances that a couple of them are going to survive are very high. If they lay more than five eggs, they probably didn't get enough nutrients and less are going to survive. So here you can see the distribution. Here are birds that lay less than four eggs, four to five eggs, and more than five eggs. And so as time goes on, it is adaptive to have four to five eggs. So this curve starts shrinking. The number, of off the number of birds that have less than four or more than five shrinks until eventually we have a very, very narrow curve because it is more adaptive to lay four to five eggs than five. So this variation right here was important because if all birds laid four eggs or less than four eggs and there was nothing else, then there would never be any reason to change we would be stuck at laying less than four eggs. But since some lay less than four, some lay four to five, and some lay more than five, it's possible that we could have this change. So that variation was very important there. Another example of stabilizing selection is human birth weight. So um, this is around where most babies are born. So this is the percentage of infant mortality, and this is birth weight. So you can see that right around here, um, right around three kilos, three kilos is, is the uh, most advantageous. That's when infant mortality is the lowest. So that's why it makes sense, most sense that most babies are born in this area. If we have babies born very far down here, they're unlikely to survive because they are not fully developed. And if we have babies that are all the way over here, they're not, it's going to be a pretty difficult childbirth to give birth to a 15 pound baby. So they're less likely to survive as well. So stabilizing selection, we see a change from a wider curve to a narrow curve. So the peak narrows in stabilizing selection. The next one is directional selection. And in this case, our extreme phenotypes are, are favored and the curve moves in one direction. So it's gonna pick either right or left. So the population is adapting to a changing environment. And for example, um, horses is a great example of directional selection. Ancestors of horses, like right here, the hierocortherium, uh, were much smaller because they lived in forests, but as the habitat changed to open grasslands over time, it became more advantageous to be larger and be able to run more um, because this guy wouldn't, ad wouldn't be very adaptive to a forest because he's larger. Remember when we talked about an elephant moving through a forest, that would be more challenging. So when they lived in forests, it was adaptive to be smaller, but as time went on and the environment changed, we had some that were bigger. So these guys became more advantageous, and so it turned to this. And then eventually these guys became more advantageous, and it turned to this. So as we changed to grassland, a larger body type was favored, and that's how we got the common horse today. So that is directional selection. We see a uh, change in the curve in one direction. The peak shifts. The last one that we have is called disruptive selection. And this is when two extreme phenotypes are favored over the intermediate. 
So the example here are these things called British land snails. So they either live in forests or in low veg vegetation, and because of this they have evolved two extreme phenotypes for depending on where they live. You can see the difference in the differences in the shells. There's images and there's the actual snails. So um, they are preyed on by birds called thrushes, and in forests the thrushes can see and eat the light-colored snails, and in the low vegetation they can see and eat the dark colored snails. So in the forests the dark colored snails have an adaptation because they can't be eaten by the birds and in the low vegetation the light colored snails have an adaptation. So because of this we see the curve split in two. So the intermediates can be seen in both examples so that's not very helpful to them. But these guys over here that let's say they are the dark ones they are favored in the forest and these guys are favored in the low vegetation. So we see two extreme phenotypes favored and the middle ones not very advantageous. So those are the three kinds of natural selection. Stabilizing selection, directional selection, and disruptive selection. Then we have this other thing called sexual selection. And sexual selection are adaptive changes in males and females that lead to an increased ability to secure a mate. So um, remember, we're always working towards fitness. We always want to survive and reproduce the best. So sexual selection is um, natural selection between males and females that have to do with their different traits. So the first one that we talk about is called female choice. And females, like we said, produce so few eggs compared, compared to how much sperm a man makes. So the choice of mate becomes really um, important for the female because they only have one egg that, or a handful of eggs that they are going to be able to use. So there's two hypotheses for this. The first one is called the good genes hypothesis. This is on page 297 in your textbook also. Good genes hypothesis is that um, females choose mates on the basis of traits that improve the chances of survival. So if they see a trait in a, in a male and they think that that will help their offspring live long enough to reproduce, they're going to choose that male because they want their offspring to survive and reproduce. The other option is the runaway hypothesis. This is also known as the sexy son hypothesis and that is that females choose mate, mates on the basis of how attractive they are because then they think that their male offspring will be more likely to be chosen. So that is the sexy son or runaway hypothesis. Um, and having sexual selection comes from something called um, sexual dimorphism, which means that males and females are different. Um, they have different body types or different body sizes or colorings or whatever. And this here is an example of the Ragiana bird of paradise. You can see that the males are much larger and more um, flamboyant than the females. That is because the females are choosing a mate here, so they do not have to impress anyone. They get to do the choosing. They are choosing the males, and so the males are going to try and be as large and colorful and beautiful as they can. That way, the female will choose them. So this actually goes along with both hypotheses, which is why it's difficult to pick one, because um, the, the big colorful flowers might show the female that they have a lot of, um, that they are strong, that they are very healthy because they can produce such beautiful feathers. So that would be an example of the of the good genes hypothesis because they're saying look I am strong enough to do this your kids are going to be that strong or it might be the sexy son hypothesis the runaway hypothesis because they are very beautiful so they so their sons will be very beautiful and will be chosen by females um, there's also a lot of male competition and um, so there's competition between males for females and there's also competition between males for space so there's these things called dominance hierarchies, which are where um, there's a higher ranking, it's a higher ranking system where one animal is kind of in charge of everything else. And so um, by, baboons are dimorphic, and like we said, the males are larger than the females, and they um, can become very aggressive. So usually there's one male dominant, one dominant male. Um, and they get the chance to mate first with the females, but there is a cost for this. Um, being larger means that he needs more food, and being willing, he must be willing to fight all the time to maintain his dominance. So that's um, that's the cost of being the the alpha male. But there is a benefit because they get to mate with all the females first. So that is something called cost benefit analysis. It is really just weighing um, the ad advantages versus the disadvantages of 
of a trait. Um, so that is section 16.2. There's a little bit more on a red male deer, so you can read that on your own. Be sure that you do. And that's natural selection.